Uh, thanks everyone for joining us for another session of Real Estate 101. This is our third session. Um, we are excited to be with you here. Uh, I'm Richard Varga from Midtown Cleveland. And with me tonight, I'm Michael Elliott, Director of Neighborhood Economic Development with Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. Awesome. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about, this is our third session in a four-part series that we're talking uh, about. Tonight we're talking about real estate and the law, parties, rights, zoning, contracts, all these really nuanced little things and um before we get started you know we wanted to just do a quick recap on on the last two sessions you know we started this series really talking about how you know real estate is viewed from our industry as a community development tool and how that differs from uh how private industry looks at real estate and the ways that midtown and neighborhood progress and other CDCs look at it as um, uh, an avenue for great placemaking and urban development, while the, the private industry really looks at it as a, a financial asset. And the goal of both our organizations is really to think about how it can be both. Um, but we also talked a lot about the who are the key players in real estate development and uh, you know, the picture of the baseball team really represents how many different types of folks come together to make these uh, deals uh, and development projects happen. So trying to do a little level setting there. And then in the second session, we talked about the stages of development and the development process and the really a lot of the questions that need to be asked before construction starts and all of these um, uh, the items listed here are really what we call pre-development questions, things that you want to uh, be asking yourselves before you start a real estate project um, and, and how, how we, what questions we ask, what questions developers ask, uh, and the whatnot. All right. Um, so before we get started tonight, though, we have a, uh, if you go on to the next slide, please. Michael? So we have a disclaimer, everyone. Um, shout out, special shout out to uh, our legal team at CMP and um, students at uh, Case Question Reserve, um, or a graduate, uh, who helped us put together this uh, legal disclosure. So I won't read it all, but uh, everyone, please take a look at it. Again, we're emphasizing we are not lawyers, uh, but again, we welcome anyone who may be, a, be from the legal profession to definitely add some color um, if you see it uh, needed. Uh, we definitely want to make sure this is kind of conversational as well. Uh, so if you are from a, uh, a legal background, uh, feel free to put any information in the chat uh, that will shed some light on this discussion today. All right, well, let's start off with uh, what is real estate or um, law? Um, so basically, real estate uh, law really is about your rights to buy and sell real estate um, how you can use uh, real estate that you own, um, how one can encumber or limit the use of real estate uh, in their possession, and how one can uh, transfer and or acquire um, real estate uh, for themselves. Since most real estate, if not, well, all real estate is typically um, stays in one location, uh, most of real estate law is focused on the state level. Uh, but the federal government plays an important role as well, too. So, for example, Federal Aviation Administration establishes the altitude in by which planes uh, may fly over your private property. Um, and probably even a more familiar uh, case would be the uh, Federal Fair Housing uh, Act, uh, which protects individuals from being discriminated against um, in real estate transactions based on race, color, religion and sex or national origin. Uh, so legal, when it comes to law, again, you have the federal, state, and local level also plays a role as it relates to uh, restricting how one uses their land. 
Great. And so uh, to give this a little bit of historical context, you know, the these laws didn't come out of nowhere. And really, when we think about real estate uh, and the, the laws that govern everything, we go all the way back to the feudal system of land that had been owned by the kings um, and then divided up and transferred along the way uh, throughout time and history. And so these laws have been uh, have created a system over hundreds and hundreds of years uh, that form the basis of uh, the European system, which the American system and what we use today uh, is based on. All right. As someone who is looking to own real, real estate, uh, you are entitled to a special uh, what's called bundle of rights. And uh, these rights uh, grant you the ability or privileges um, or interests um, uh, uh, assisted with landowners. Um, these sets of rights are, are complex. And basically they are, some examples are possession. So you have the right to possess your property. Uh, you have the right to use or enjoy your property, encumber, sell, or um, not do anything at all. Um, as I stated, it's very complex. So for example, uh, when it comes to use of your property to enjoy, for example, if you wanna put in a backyard pool or patio, um, there could be some limitations that you're um, zoning, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later, um, that may restrict you from not being too rowdy in your particular property, because it may affect uh, what's going on in the, your residents um, or your neighbor's um, land as well too. Next slide. So what's also very interesting about real estate is that uh, we're not just talking about the land on your, um, that your feet are standing on. So what that land is called is called surface rights or the rights to, to that piece of, uh, to that property. But your property actually extends all the way down to the earth's, to the core of the earth uh, from the surface and all the way up uh, into the air. And so there are lots of different ways where people think about when they talk about physical improvements that get made to, um, to the surface, they're really, or, or a building that is built on a piece of land, people are really talking about the physical improvement on the surface of the land. But as Michael was just pointing out, there are other ways or other uh, rights that you have to the air above you and to the land below you. And so when you hear about oil companies buying up the mineral rights below the surface of the earth, what they're really talking about is that a landowner may sell the land that is beneath them or um, you might hear of a, uh, the power company may run power lines above your property and they may have, uh, they may have uh, some type of a, an easement to the air right above your property. So you're, you just have to keep remembering that your bundle of rights to your land extends all the way to the center of the earth and all the way above uh, to, to the top of the, as far as the eye can see. And so when people talk about, you know, a developer puts up a building and they block their view of downtown or something, you know, the, I always think that it's too bad that that neighbor didn't know that they could go and buy the air rights or, uh, um, make a deal for the air rights above, you know, to not block their view. Next slide. And so when, uh, when you think about the actual property that you own in the, in the legal definitions uh, of real estate, they come down to within a building, you're really talking about two different types of property. You have real property and you have personal property. And I always make the analogy, this is a pretty good, this is a pretty good picture. Um, real property stays with the land. 
personal property can go with you. You can take off of the land. And so um, what I'm always thinking about is in a real estate deal, if I were to sell my house, um, I really want to take all the lighting fixtures or the doorknobs that are in the house. It's a historic home, right? And you've got these piece, you know, these pieces of the house that I want to take with me. It's all considered real property until I spell out in the contract that I'm taking it and that I'm going to take it. I'm going to make it personal property and take it with me. So the, the, um, this is a big, this is a big, uh, a definite, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about contracts and what's in a contract and what's not in a contract. But when you think about uh, a building, you need to think about the bricks and mortar, really the real property, the furniture on the inside, that is personal property. Next slide. Okay. And so it's a perfect segue into contracts. So in the world of real estate, everything is bound by legal documents and legal uh, agreements. Uh, and the two most important documents that you really need to know about are, are two different types of contracts. One is called a deed and one is called a purchase agreement. Um, so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about deeds first before we talk about purchase agreement. Next slide. So deeds, deeds are documents that run with the land. They identify who the owner of the property is and they have been, and they are recorded in on the public record in books that are in volumes and volumes and volumes that trace back to the very first owner of the land. And this is a way that you can find out who has a right to the land that you are interested in. And this all got made much easier uh, in the last 15 years with, with uh, the advent uh, of computer systems uh, that track and scan and, and you can look up these deeds. But in, in general, in, in generally speaking, all deeds are recorded uh, on the public record and kept with the uh, Cuyahoga County recorder or down at the uh, administration office now for uh, so that if there was a, a dispute about who owned the land, a judge could go to uh, the, the public record and look and make a determination either way about who the rightful owner of this land was. All right, so let's take a moment and just talk about a particular type of deed um, as potential developers and real estate owners, and those are conveyance deeds. A conveyance deed is basically a contract in which the seller uh, transfer the rights that we just talked about to a legal owner. Uh, the purchase of property is not complete without a valid conveyance deed. So when we talk about conveyance, we're basically talking about uh, refers to the act of transferring the title ownership rights that we discussed before and interest to the property um, in a property from one entity to another. That could be individual to individual or company to company. Uh, the term deed refers to an instrument like a written con document uh, contract um, that is signed by all parties to a contract, in this case, the seller and the buyer as it relates to real estate. Next slide. So here are some very common uh, deeds. Now they may go by other names and these are not the only kind of deeds that are out there, but these are maybe three common types of deeds that you may come across as uh, potential developers or real estate owners. First of all, the quick claim deed. Uh, this is a legal document uh, that transfers um, whenever uh, the interest of the uh, someone has in a certain piece of uh, real estate. Um, one of the unique things about this, and we'll talk about another type of big deed, is there's no guarantee that the deed comes 
uh, with a guarantee that the owner properly owns the particular real estate. So you want to make sure that if you're going through a quick deed process, make sure you're speaking with your attorney to make sure that the understanding the requirements or understanding the uh, um, pitfalls of a particular this type of deed. A warranty deed does provide some level of guarantee that the owner, the current owner of the property that's selling it um, does actually own the property. And then a share sale deed is a deed that, um, again, we may be familiar when it comes to foreclosure processes. Um, this is a particular deed that is at a share sale. Um, you want to make sure that you be keep being careful with this particular kind of deed as well, too, as it comes with no guarantee of a clean title. Next slide. So some just some general takeaways is that you want to make sure that you're speaking to your attorney about all the uh, pitfalls and all of the benefits when it comes to uh, reviewing conveyance deeds. Um, again, the seller is required to certify that the property is free of any legal encumbrances. Um, if there is a loan that's being taken out for this particular part mortgage, you want to make sure that's clear uh, before the deed is signed. Uh, conveyance deed should state the exact time in which the property uh, would be handed over to the uh, buyer. And finally, uh, within uh, four months of executing a uh, deed, all the original documents uh, related to the sale of the property need to be uh, produce for a registration before the uh, a local registrar. Make sure you work with your particular uh, legal counsel to make sure that all these things are in right place. Next slide. Okay, and so the really critical aspect of the deed, while you may have two people agree um, that one is going to sell, you know, Michael is going to sell me a, a piece of property. The other component of this is that we're just not writing down on this piece of paper an address, you know, say, you know, 3800 Detroit Avenue. Um, what's actually included in the deed is what's called a legal description. And we've talked about surveyors before. And the purpose of a surveyor, you may have seen them out in, in the street with, um, measuring equipment um, to go out and actually look at the legal boundaries uh, of the piece of property that is in question. And so here you can see um, the actual legal descriptions as it says, um, a certain lot or parcel situated in, in New Sharon, Maine, blah, 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 beginning at, at an iron rebar found flush in the ground. Right, and that's like the demarcation point, and then they measure specifically from that point. And generally, there's a map that's included, uh, as you can see, to actually outline the exact boundaries. Because, uh, as as you know, uh, people are very very particular about where their property ends and another person's property starts. So this legal description and map help identify what is exactly your piece of property. And so again, back to what I was saying earlier, this got remarkably easier with the advent of uh, GIS and computer systems where the county and, and many counties around uh, the country were able to electronically create records that are easily searchable on their website so that you can look up not only that document of, a, uh, of ownership, but also find the deed in question with the legal descriptions all through um, by just looking at a map. So this is uh, an incredibly helpful tool in terms of determining ownership um, and uh, transfers of parcels. All right, well, let's just go a little bit into uh, what a purchase agreement is, which is a form of a contract. Um, a contract is, uh, of this nature is really made up of two things, an offer and an acceptance. Uh, the offer is a specific and def definite um, proposition to the offeree uh, that basically is saying, uh, manifesting the uh, offerer clear uh, intention to be bound. And an acceptance is an you know, you know, equivocal, excuse me, agreement by the offeree 
in all terms of the offer made directly to the offeror of the agent. So that's basically a nutshell of a contract. Again, for more information, make sure you talk with your legal counsel and making sure that everything is in place with your contract. Next slide. Sorry, Song. So uh, I love, you know, I love this image because, um, you know, when I was taking, uh, when, I, when I was taking real estate law in, in college, um, you know, my professor, he just described uh, real estate law as really the wild, wild west. If it's not in the contract, it's not in the contract. And uh, as it pertains to what is in the contract, uh, every contract is different. Every line in every contract is different. Um, the elements, the basic elements of what you are, what you're seeing, however, are that there's an agreement between the two parties. You know, a, a buyer and a seller are agreeing that this is what we're trying to do. We've got to, you know, we are, no one is forcing anybody to do this. Um, there is a consideration, some form of monetary payment uh, in consideration for your piece of property. And that this document is our uh, intention to enter legal relations. So my party is contractually obligated to Michael's party um, if we were buyer and seller. Other than that, everything is, uh, everything is the wild, wild west. And so when I say, uh, you know, if I don't include that I want to take the doorknobs in my property, or if I don't include that I want the doorknobs in my property, um, then there's no, there's no dispute. There's no way to resolve that dispute. Um, you know, we have people show up to, you know, sellers have sold buildings to, uh, to new buyers and the historic doors were removed. You say, well, it's the door, right? Well, if you didn't put in the contract that you wanted the door to stay or you were going to take the door, there's no legal recourse in any way. You can't go to a judge and say, well, I wanted that door. Was it in the contract? No. Okay. So you, you really have to be thoughtful about your intentions of what you're entering a contract uh, for. Again, I, I mean, like we're not lawyers, but just remember if it's, if it, if it's not in the contract, it's not in the contract. So. We're just going to talk a little bit about the players. Again, in the first session, we talked a lot about how important it is to make sure you have the right players around you as it relates to kind of real estate development uh, within uh, this industry. So just using myself and Barga as an example, Barga is going to be the seller. I'm going to be a buyer. Again, we're going to enter in some form of a contract. Typically, uh, we may have someone like a real estate broker uh, who is going to assist us in a contract, especially if one of us or both of us do not are not familiar with the process. It might be wise or beneficial as we go through this process to have a broker who's going to work with us. I'll have my own broker representing me. Uh, Varga will have his own broker that will represent him as the seller and the uh, buyer. Or then it, as a buyer, I'm going to probably most likely uh, have a uh, lender that's going to be at play as well too. Uh, so again, another player within the uh, real estate dynamic that we have here. And then we have this uh, middle player here, this kind of neutral agent or third party, that's kind of the escrow company, which one we kind of put documents in and take document out and then make sure everything is clearing out. So again, it's very critical as you become developers or real estate owners. Again, we're going to hone in on the fact, the importance of making sure that you have a great team around you to make sure that you are covering all your bases nothing is being missed um, as it relates to real estate transactions. Next slide. All right, so people go to law school for like multiple years to learn about real estate law, what we just did in like 20 minutes. So let's pause for questions. 
there's volumes and dissertations and everything. If anybody has questions, please uh, pop them in the chat or in the Q and A. Um, uh, we are de we'll definitely send out the slides after this uh, presentation is over, um, and you'll you'll get access. You know the the recordings are all put on YouTube if you want to rewatch uh, anything. I don't see any questions, Michael. So uh, let's keep rolling. All right. Let's get into a little bit about some zoning, a little safer area for us. Uh, I don't think we can get in trouble with zoning out uh, here. So the purpose of zoning, next slide, please. Purpose of zoning is really to protect the uh, public health and welfare of the uh, community, uh, to promote community character by organizing land uh, into clearly defined districts based on the type of industry or an intensity of the use. Uh, basically, we have, and it got a little broken off, I apologize for that, but we got residential, uh, commercial, industrial, and open space. Uh, for most maps uh, throughout the country, those are typically a certain color. So if you go through uh, any kind of urban planning school, uh, you'll know a little bit about kind of what the, each color means just by looking at them. Uh, but again, it could change um, based on uh, where your municipality and planning department uses. Next slide. Uh, so again, some additional basic zoning basics. Again, the uh, zoning codes consist of basically two parts, the map, which you can see there, as well as the regulations. And as I spoke about in the other slide, again, it's broken down in particular type of um, um, zoning areas. Um, again, residential, commercial, industrial, um, institutional, and open space. And then within these zoning rules and regulations what we're really trying to drill down into is the details around what are the specifics around the type of project that you want to do or that you see around your neighborhood so you know these details relate specifically to the real property uh, the size how dense you can build it or how how tall and how many units um, the placement of your building uh, whether it is set back from the street or whether it, it needs to be pushed to the front of the street, um, the height, how tall you can build, um, provisions for adequate light and air. That's a uh, that's a that's one that's um, really more specific for downtown uh, developments. Uh, parking is obviously a huge issue. Uh, where the zoning code uh, dictates how many parking spaces you're able to put on on your development uh, and other things like landscaping and signage. And so we uh, the, the zoning rules are really designed to help give developers and owners an idea of what is permitted uh, uh, on on their on their properties. To pop quiz here. Um, so Barga, uh, what is the first city? Uh, what was the first city that passed a citywide zoning ordinance? And what year? Let's see if anybody, uh, if any of our attendees want to pop an, an idea in the chat and see if they if there are any any thoughts out there. Give it a second here before I show the answer. This is my professor Barga. Um, <laughs> Alter ego. Anybody have any thoughts? What city was the first to pass zoning? Oh, Cleveland. No, unfortunately, it's not Cleveland. Anybody That's what else? I said. That, that was... Anybody else? Any other thoughts? It was actually, all right, we'll roll on and show the answer. It was actually New York City in uh, 1916 and the, so the zoning codes were the building the history is is that the buildings were uh being built taller and taller and taller um in downtown new york and the um and what was happening was is that the light from the from sunlight was not reaching down to the ground because they were building so tall up 
and they weren't able, and people on the ground were not able to, to see. So New York passes this comprehensive um, zoning code that um, see, that, uh, that no, it's no problem, Cherry. It was a great guess. It was a great guess. Um, passes the the first comprehensive zoning code um, uh, in nineteen sixteen. All right, next question. Where was zoning first challenged and upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court? Any takers? Going once. This, is, this one's a little closer to home, so uh, there's your hint. Anybody? Anybody? All right, let's show the answer here, Alex. It was actually in Euclid, Ohio. So the landmark Supreme Court zoning case, which set the precedent for how, which gave the power to municipalities to lay out their cities based on what they perceived the health and wellness of their citizens to be was actually in Euclid, Ohio. And uh, it came about because there was a company called Cleveland Tractor and the Amber Realty Company owned 60 acres, 60 or 68 acres of land and that they had not built on yet. But this factory was, uh, they were planning expansions into residential neighborhoods. And the, so the, the city passes a zoning code that says, no, 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 no. You're not allowed to build factories in residential neighborhoods. And so Amber Realty challenged it uh, at the state and at the federal level, all the way up to the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court uh, ruled that it was actually the municipality's right to lay out these zoning codes um, and that Amber could not build another factory in a residential neighborhood. And that was the, uh, and that was in 19, what's that science? I think that was like 1918. Um, it was very shortly after because zoning the, you know, development in cities at that time at the turn of the century was booming, right? And, and there was really lots of uh, buildings going up all over the place. So you had cities passing these zoning codes to try to prevent, um, you know, what we would call like a noxious use in neighborhood planning. Next question, is zoning a part of the law? Anybody have any idea? This is easy, yes or no? What do we think? Anybody in the chat? Got some quiet guests tonight. Going once. Oh, Miss Beverly has her hand up. Ms. Beverly has her hand up. Yes or no? Yes, Miss Beverly. All right. <laughs> Great. The answer is yes. The zoning text is actually uh, a law that is adopted by the city council of the city of Cleveland or, or you know, in the county. And uh, again, this is, you know, it establishes these zones and the uses that are allowed inside the, these zones. And, um, and so that's how we're able, you know, the city, city council sets up all of its zoning rules and regulations and it actually gets adopted. So if a new district is created or, or a change to the zoning code, it is actually a change to the law. And so if we go on to the next slide, this is actually a screenshot of what the zoning code actually looks like if you were to look it up online. And in this, in this particular example, this actually points out the Midtown mixed use district and the permitted versus the conditional uses 
on different streets and blocks and uh, types of developments that you see here. So when you see, you know, Euclid MMUD1 or Chester MMUD2, those refer to zones within the district. And then you can see what is the permitted or conditional or not permitted use here on each one of these. Let's go on to the next slide. And this is actually the map that correlates with that district. And so the orange that you're looking at here on the bottom right actually is our Chester Avenue uh, MMUD4 zone and MMUD1. These are the different types of uses that are prescribed in the zoning code and, and allowable by law. All right, well, let's talk about a few more terms, um, zoning terms that you'll come across as you, uh, you know, seek uh, increased interest in the real estate uh, industry. Uh, permitted use. So just like we uh, kind of discussed in the prior map, um, all of those areas are zoned for a particular use, uh, whether that could be commercial, industrial, retail. And if your particular project that you are planning to develop or you're looking to purchase a particular piece of property, um, if it is already zoned for that particular use, you're good to go. It's a permitted use for that particular uh, district. Now, there are some instances, and I'm thinking about maybe certain neighborhoods, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think uh, Tremont has kind of a unique kind of uh, non-conforming use where it's weird sometimes when I'm driving down certain streets and certain kind of uses seem out of place. Well, sometimes uh, those businesses were able to be grandfathered in, meaning that, hey, the uh, city has determined that a particular new use uh, or new zoning code would be er um, for that particular area. But for whatever reason, they were able to get themselves grandfathered. So you might see a situation where it looks like um, a pizza parlor, for example, is in the middle of a retail, uh, excuse me, a, a residential district, for example. That business was probably grandfathered in um, in some way, shape, or form. And then variances is what I hear a lot, especially when we were working uh, within City Hall Barga. We, we hear a lot of uh, um, um, developers or, or even individual or residents um, looking for variances or basically changes in the terms of the existing zoning code. Um, due to some type of economic or physical hardship. So if you're looking to make any kind of changes to the existing zoning code, you're going to have to have to seek out an, a, um, a variance, whether through a city council or uh, some type of zoning board of appeals. Next slide. So a lot of words here, um, not going to read all of them, but basically um, as you get into the real estate industry, you want to probably find out how can I protect my property's value? Well, this slide here talks about many different ways, but in essence, it adds three things. Um, zoning code is protected by providing some type of predictability, uh, uniformity, as well as appearance standards. And so when it comes to predictability, if I buy a residential home or residential property within a particular area, I want to feel confident that mm, maybe a year from now, somebody's not going to build like an industrial warehouse in right beside uh, my building. Um, and for uniformity, you know, if I, again, still buying that residential house, I want to get a sense that my house is going to look somewhat similar to the house next to me as far as height, um, as far as I mean, set asides or setbacks or fence heights. I'm sure we've had, um, I've heard of many situations where fences became very um, attentious with when it comes to uh, property owners. They don't like the fences too high or they don't like it at all. Uh, so with some type of zoning codes in place, there's some type of uh, uniformity across um, zoning areas. And appearance as well, too. This is something a lot of CDC struggle with when it comes into their neighborhood. Uh, the appearance standards. So standards regarding uh, what a building looks like on the outside, keeping up with a particular area. Um, zoning codes help put, the, put about some type of standards for everyone to abide by so that we can maintain our property values. Next slide. And so, you know, just like this slide says, most communities use zoning to codify and enforce the land use concept. So if somebody builds a building, 
that is not up to zoning code, they can be cited by law um, and have, uh, I mean, I haven't seen that happen too often because like the, the process of getting building permits uh, requires that you are that you fall in line with the zoning code or that you go to get a variance um, in, in each in, uh, particular case. And so, you know, from Midtown's perspective, you know, uh, the, when we created the Midtown mixed use district, we thought long and hard about our neighborhood plan and our infrastructure goals and what we were trying to achieve. And so that helps us steer um, the zoning code to uh, a more favorable vision of what um, of what we're looking for in our neighborhood. Next slide. And so this is not just in our neighborhood, but this is in all around Cleveland. And so, and there are different types of districts, as you can see here. You've got, uh, you know, this is West Twenty Fifth Street uh, over on in Ohio City. And there are multiple different types of districts. There are overlays for where, where we are trying to encourage pedestrian traffic or, um, or cyclists, um, where there are um, different types. I mean, all the different uses are, are being, um, they look like they're cobbled together, but they really are designed to help um, promote health and wellness in each neighborhood. Okay, so we got here a little early, uh, um, but this is really complicated stuff. Um, and as Michael and I said, like, we're not experts by any means. Um, neither one of us are planners or uh, lawyers. So this session is, um, We'll, we'll put it out there like this. We're happy to take any questions that you guys might have, but uh, please bear with us if we have a, uh, if we say, ask an attorney. <laughs> so please, the chat, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A um, to send us any questions you have right now. Normally we get a lot more questions. It's quite, quite a bunch tonight. All right. Well, um, if there are no questions, we'll uh, we'll keep going. I got a, a few more slides here. Um, wanted to to wrap up this series. This has been a great this has been a great program. Uh, Michael and I have enjoyed it. Our, the, our last session uh, is going up oh, right when I said it. Okay. Do you ever come across any NIMBY laws? So NIMBY means not in my backyard. For, for those of you, who, do you ever come across any NIMBY laws? I'm not sure. Um, so to describe, I guess what, uh, I'm not sure about laws. Let's, I'll take a minute and try to talk about what NIMBY means. Um, in certain neighborhoods, at, you know, anywhere, Really, there could be a, uh, no, NIMBY is not a law. It's just a acronym to describe uh, people in a community who get together um, and organize to protest against uh, a new development that um, they believe is not in line with the zoning code or that is uh, to let their city councilman or city council in general or the planning commission know that they're not in favor of this project. And we call those NIMBYs because they not, not in my backyard really means please don't build, please don't let somebody build this building uh, in my neighborhood. So we see that a lot in residential, you know, like single family residential neighborhoods where you have multifamily or apartment buildings being built and, uh, and homeowners saying, not in my backyard, please. Um, so because the zoning code may allow for it, but um, there are avenues through 
your public officials to actually um, protest whether or not the you're you want that development or not. But no, it is not a law. All right. Um, so next month we're going to dive a little deeper into um, financing. The other aspect of of uh, real estate development really um, really involves understanding the money and thinking about uh, how you can leverage your money uh, and uh, to help make your real estate development project work. And so we're excited. Uh, we're going to walk through a simple pro forma and understand some ideas around sources and uses, which we've talked about previously, and try to get an understanding of uh, how buildings cash flow uh, and, and can put money back in, in investors' pockets. So it'll be a great, great last session to end with for those who are kind of looking for money and want to figure out how to get it and leverage it. And leverage it. All right. And so uh, next slide. And so just a few other things that are going on in Midtown. Uh, we've launched a, a neighborhood career services hotline with our partners at Towards Employment. That number is 216-399-3550. We have an exciting Juneteenth celebration happening on Saturday over at the Dunham Tavern. Please come down and join us. It's, it's free. Um, we are bringing food trucks back to Midtown, which is really exciting, uh, every Tuesday from 11 to 1.30. Uh, we're having food trucks back at Colonel Young uh, Park at 46th and Prospect. So uh, I think there are snow cones coming next week for anybody that's interested. So that's pretty awesome. And then, you know, continuing this, this series. Um, so thank you for joining. Um, I did want to bring up, we had some questions about uh, legal representation prior to this session and that people have asked about, like who, who can they go to, to talk about. Um, there's a, a group, another nonprofit group that we work with called the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, who provide free services to uh, community groups and nonprofits, um, specifically those who cannot afford an attorney, but uh, you know are seeking legal advice if you're interested. Um, please call uh, Catherine Donnelly at 216-297-7968 and we'll send out with the slides, you'll get, uh, you'll get this information as well. So, like I said, Michael and I are not lawyers, but these are lawyers. So please, please call them um, if you have concerns or, or other legal issues. All right, so uh, we'll give you 10 minutes back here. It's a beautiful uh, June night and Thanks again, everybody, for joining. We hope to see you uh, in July.